you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. I'm Oaks Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. As always, the Chris Voss Show is the family that loves you but doesn't judge you, at least not as harshly as your father did because, I don't know, he preferred your brother. Anyway, guys, I prefer to show your family, friends, and relatives. Go to goodreads.com. I'm scarring people from and bringing up trauma from the beginning of the show. This is what we do here. It's all about trauma. Go to goodreads.com, for says Chris Voss, LinkedIn.com, for says Chris Voss, all those crazy places on the internet. You know them. Well, you always have the most amazing authors and minds on the show. I'm the the idiot of the show with the mic. That's what we have to do. We have to balance the show, as it were. We have a brilliant author on the show. Her, her latest book came out January 11th, 2023. It's called Plan to Recover, your mini journal for recovery and self-discovery. Andrea M. Epting is on the show with us today. She'll be talking to us about her latest book. She's been over 20 years of experience in the field of mental health. She's a practicing professional counselor, master addiction counselor, EMDR certified therapist, certified sex addiction addiction therapist. I should talk to her. Uh, oh, yeah. and an, an approved <laughs> clinical supervisor. I just like it. She's been a pre- <laughs> she, who doesn't. Andrea has been a private practitioner since 2007 and specialized in the treatment of trauma initiated process addictions, dopamine deficiencies, sexual dysfunctions, compulsive behaviors, and partner betrayal. She just described my sex life. She is uh, the founder of the CEO of NCO of Heads Up Guidance Services, Inc., where clinicians provide pro bono services to meet community mental health needs. And she's the founder of Why Is Mind Industries, Lightning in a Bottle Digital Courses, and the host of the Direct Impact Podcast. Welcome to the show. How are you, Andrea? Oh, Chris, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here with you and your audience. So thank you. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Some of the things that are in your bio describe my last seven marriages. So. You and a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start off. I, was there any dot coms we need to get out of you to so people know where to find you? I appreciate you asking. Lightning in a bottle dot biz. So uh, www.lightninginabottle.biz. dot biz. There you go. Keep it in easy. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about this new book, Plan to Recover. Yeah. So it's a mini j- journal, a 90 day journal for recovery and self discovery. And it's what we call a bullet journal. Mm-hmm. And we basically plan to recover. So it has a lot to do with planning and automating healthy habits, behaviors, mm-hmm. AM routines, PM routines, and then reflecting on self as part of a daily check-in. And so we really have seen that when people show up to this journal regularly and daily, they can automate new behaviors in 90 days. There you go. Yeah. How come you didn't make one for unhealthy habits? This is about taking your unhealthy habits and either putting them on the shelf or spending some time just changing your relationship with them, Mm. or you can put in some healthier habits or things you might want to engage with more often. There you go. Or mm-hmm. you can just put on healthy habits you want to develop more. Yeah. Drink more vodka. Don't do that, kids. It's bad. It tells me <laughs> you say that. So there you go. What what made you come up with the idea for this? I, just years of experience with both mental health and addiction recovery. Oh. I really have seen that when people are motivated towards change, they still really struggle with implementing it. So motivation just really isn't enough because they don't really have those trust bonds or connections with themselves to trust that they're going to show up every day. And this really helps them to stay accountable to self and build a healthier relationship to that person inside. So Makes go. a difference. Yeah. So you, you've you been in this business for a long time. Tell us yeah. a little bit about how you grew up, what motivated you want to get into this business, and where you know, you've arrived today. Yeah. So I got into this field re- relatively haphazardly. <laughs> I, I went to I school for- I my car and suddenly <laughs> I was in I, I 
I really, I, I went to school for uh, design and I was going to be an interior designer. That's what I went for. Oh, wow. And I just felt this pull and I really started enjoying my psychology classes. I really loved what I was getting into and I was finding out more about myself and others and my relationships. And, and I also really liked my religion classes. So I just double majored in religion and <laughs> And in psychology, instead of getting that design degree I went for. So <laughs> that's well, how that happened. You're technically doing interior design. You're just doing ah. the mind, right? Oh, good call. Yeah. Yeah, see? yeah, the internal landscape. <laughs> this is why they give me five bucks a day for this <laughs> Yeah, that, that's good. And they throw me some scraps every now and then for food, and they let me out for walks in the in the sun once a day for an hour. That's important. <laughs> yeah, that's what they tell me. So this kind of was a journal that you developed from your years of being in the business and understanding some of the different aspects of what people are struggling well, with. Yeah, and also paying attention to my own struggles, mm -hmm. uh, what was going on inside of me, the things I was struggling with implementing on a consistent basis. And so it's the journal I developed for myself that wound up really changing my life. And so I thought, geez, if this is helping and working for me, it will help and work for my clients and probably all human beings. I mean, it's developed for humans. It's not developed for a specific type of human. It's developed for all of us who have certain struggles and tendencies and weaknesses mm -hmm. that we would, it would behoove us to look at. <laughs> why do you do one for dogs and cats? Like why leave them out? No, I'm what just kidding. It, yeah. <laughs> why, why do you think Chris? They don't read. And plus they're really <laughs> bad with their with their hand-eye coordination of turning pages. I think it's the lack of thumbs, perhaps. Yeah, the, the thumbs, yeah. <laughs> the you got thumbs. it. The opposable thumbs. That always <laughs> yeah, it'd be hard to write in your journal. Yeah. That's what I that's what I that's what I tell my dogs. I look at them, I'm like, when do you guys quit laying around this place and get some jobs? And they're like, We got no thumbs. <laughs> so that's kind of a problem, yeah. I guess. Which is probably better because otherwise they'd be opening doors and getting into stuff. And causing all sorts of problems, and they're huskies. So they do that anyway. One question I have for you that I, yeah. I, I've, you know, I studied psychol. I'm an amateur layman, mm -hmm. uh, study psychologer, but uh, <laughs> study of psychologer. That's is that not even a word. Um, no, no, it, but we. I mean, it should be. I know. I I, th I heard once, and I can't remember who said that. It might have been Doctor Drew. Someone said that a lot of people that are in addiction recovery for and in rehab for drugs and alcohol and different things of that nature have childhood sexual trauma is that true there are all types of sexual trauma hmm. there's overt and covert so sometimes it's more of the messages the, that are received the comments the triangulation the enmeshment so when i talk about that it's kind of like when the son is playing the role of the father, that is sexual abuse. So when people hear sexual abuse, I think they tend to think of that overt, mm -hmm. obvious, physical, sexual abuse and assault. Mm -hmm. So I just, I say that to say, yes, mm -hmm. a lot of people have experienced sexual trauma, but mm -hmm. not in that traditional sense. Huh. Well, yeah. The son is playing the role of the father. That doesn't happen much, does it? All the time. Really? We had somebody on the show recently that, that mm -hmm. happened to. I told me it was rare, but you, you see more. Oh, no. It's, he probably does. Yeah, yeah. Triangulation and, you know, the children meeting the needs of the parents instead of the parents meeting their needs. That's pretty yeah. common. Yeah. Now, not to, not to minimize any of this, but I do have to give this joke in here. Can I experience trauma from just not getting any sex in the last year? <laughs> That's a joke. We call that sexual anorexia. <laughs> I'm going to put that in my Tinder profile. I'm <laughs> suffering from sexual anorexia right now, but not to <laughs> minimize folks. I'm just, sometimes we have to apply some comedy and levity to things. You, you work with people with counseling and stuff like that. Do you, do you do any of that work that people can work with you on? Or is that a local thing you're doing? Is that, is that, yeah. is that any of the services or coaching maybe you offer on a website or? Yeah. So lightning in a bottle, they do have coaches and that's something that we are working on. Mm -hmm. I have nonprofit 
locally mm-hmm. in Savannah, Georgia, and a private group practice called mm-hmm. Resolve Strategies, Inc. And clinicians are supposed to practice within their state still. There are some changes underway that's going to allow us to cr- practice across state lines. I'm excited about that. Mm-hmm. But until then, we will call what we do across state lines coaching. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes. <laughs> The, uh, it's kind of interesting how uh, how the world needs to change a little bit when it comes to the licensing and stuff. Seriously, but I guess it's you know power and money of states and what they can do. But yeah, you know, follow the seems, dollar sign. Just yeah. follow it. <laughs> I mean, it seems like if you're certified and professionally licensed and have the schooling and training, you know, we need more of you guys to be operate internationally, internationally. That's right. These, coaches and i'm not throwing all coaches on the bus folks but there's some of these coaches that are out you know like selling crystals and shit that they can work nationally but you know license exactly can't. it seems a little backwards yeah. mm-hmm. and we're we're really big on the show about how if you're going to seek therapy go see a professional don't thank don't, you don't talk to amy joe who's covered in tattoos and believes that crystals or whatever i don't know why I'm, turning against the three people listening to the show that believe in crystals, but stop it. <laughs> Knock it off. The, I see, get, seek professional help. Like seriously, I've dated all my life, the 35 years now. I should just hand out therapist cards on first dates. So do the work. When you're healed, it's it's a whole lot different. You're like, I'm not getting involved with you. You're, you're, you're not healed. What, what is the importance of using your journal and having AM and PM routines? In junior yeah. Year? Good, good question. I was not able to implement or automate anything consistently. This is just me personally. I could not do that. (laughs) No matter what kind of information, training, education, or background I had, I could not do it if I didn't have an AM routine and a PM routine that supported those changes. And I just figure if I struggled with that, other people are too. And so we say we want to change, but there are so many barriers and things stopping us and impeding our ability to do that. Like I said, even if we're motivated. And so I have found that if you really support the behavior changes with AM routines, PM routines, you can find long-term success. And this is about automating things and having healthy habits that are sustainable. That's going to give you that lifestyle shift that promotes overall health and wellness and self-love i hope so do i need to do am and pm then journaling is that better than just doing not necessarily i i journal in the pm but i have an am practice that supports the three main focuses that i have for that 90 days Mm -hmm. so in the beginning of your journal you've got this what's called the let's get moving page Mm -hmm. and you establish three behaviors that you really want to focus on for the next 90 days And so the AM routine and PM routine are supporting those three behaviors or habits. Mm. Okay. So maybe I want to disconnect from alcohol for 90 days. Maybe I want to see how that impacts my sleep. So maybe I want to disconnect from alcohol. I want to sleep seven to nine hours and I want to drink 120 ounces of water. Those are your Mm. three behaviors. How does the AM routine and PM routine support that? At night, I'm filling up my water bottle. So in the morning, it's ready to go. Yeah. So all of these things really help support change. There you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it makes sense. You, you want to make sure that you're ready for the next day. I have one of those nice reverse osmosis machines. You have to Ooh. you have to fill it to to use it. But, you know, one of the things that's important if you're going to intermittent fast or if you want to eat and drink healthy, you want to have really clean water. And it mm-hmm. makes a difference in the taste, too. Like, I'll, I'll tell people I'm intermittent fasting and I'm drinking water, and they're like, oh, I hate the taste of water. And I'm like, if you got to get... Good water get filtered, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Tasty good. It makes all the difference. Add some lemons. Yeah. What's your window? I do intermittent fasting too. I do it like a sixteen eight. Okay. So, or I try to get to sixteen. Sometimes I'm a twelve, a twelve twelve. But it kind of depends on when I want to. I start having thoughts about murdering people because I'm hungry. There's that. And then I, yeah, yeah. The judge <laughs> says I can't do that anymore. I get one of the seven ankle bracelets removed yeah. next week too. I'm happy yeah, with that. that's actually one of the triggers we identify in the journal is you know hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. So murdering uh-huh. somebody that falls under anger. <laughs> ah, there you go. It doesn't. What about or hangry? rage? What about, <laughs> or hang- about, oh, there you go. Hangry. The trigger is somewhere between. Hangry. Hungry and angry. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, just, 
There's some people that are like that. You're just they they want to destroy the world, and you're just like maybe you're just hungry. Maybe you just need a Snickers bar. That's right. And the and those triggers can really impact our behaviors for sure. <laughs> so my window is from eight a.m. to three p.m. So it's a little rough sometimes. Go. Yeah. Eight p.m. to three p.m. Eight a.m. to three p.m. Eight a.m. to three p.m. There you mm -hmm. go. I mean, breakfast is really. You don't need breakfast if you have strong enough coffee. <laughs> I have coffee not. that's got a lot of extra yeah. caffeine in it that's probably not good for my heart. But, I mean, <clears throat> I got to wake up. I, yeah. Who cares if it takes 10 years off my life? Yeah. <clears throat> and that's that, that was really the hardest part for me, switching to that time, because I never wanted breakfast. Now it forces me to have it, which has been a good, uh, good change. A good yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> some people can do it either way. There's some people that, by flipping it the other way, they... They do better with it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hey, it works. Whatever works. Yeah. Um, Whatever gets you out of your comfort zone, which is why I chose to do that. I'm like, you know, we have to really push our comfort zones <laughs> and make these changes. So it's important. There you go. Now, you, you talk about with the journal that people can use behavior automation mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. them develop healthy habits. How does the yeah. automation part work? The automation works in the sense that you are tracking in this bullet journal every day that you participate in or achieve that wanted behavior. So if the wanted behavior is to abstain from alcohol, you're tracking every single day that you are not drinking. So it's a little bit of, again, just mindfulness and noticing and paying attention. And it's also a little bit of that dopamine kick that you get every time you get to check that box and be like, yep, I did what I said I was going to do. I said I wasn't going to do it. I did it and I feel great about it. That's excellent. So after 90 days of being consistent, you really can automate that behavior. You can change your habits. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are going to be things like if you find that maybe there was an addiction at play, maybe you find that there was some dependency. Yes, of course, it's going to be more than 90 days that you're going to have to keep that on your list. That could be up to two years, but that's OK. It's there and you're paying attention to it. There you go. <laughs> I, by, by taking and doing that, you, you mentioned the dopamine hit. Yeah. I mean, being being self-accountable sounds like it's a large part of your of your journal. And being self-accountable is so important, you know, because until you can be self-accountable, can you really can you really, you know, take a hard look at what you're doing and make change? Yeah, good question. I think that we can have some level of insight and awareness without being able to hold ourselves accountable. Yeah. I think it's just it's what we call these stages of change when you look at behaviors and you look at addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, some people are in pre-contemplation, so they're not ready. They're not even looking at changing. Some people are contemplating a change. So, yeah, they're aware, but they're not ready to do anything about it. And then you can move into preparation where it's, I'm preparing now to make a change. I do realize it and I am starting to hold myself accountable. And then they might move into action where they start being consistent. Hmm. Pre, what was that term again? Pre, pre contemplation. Pre contemplation. That's interesting. Yeah. I've yes. Been in when stages. sure we all have. It's called denial. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I definitely been. There. I, live there. <laughs> I live on denial, man. That's yeah. A great river. Yeah. In Egypt, You're living on the denial. There you go. <laughs> so it it so even though is pre contemplation where you're thinking I'm in denial about what's going on, but. Maybe I should make some changes. Nope. Maybe it's time. You're just that's that's contemplation. Out. You start okay. to contemplate it. In pre-contemplation, it's really, you know, <laughs> it's say you get in trouble at work because mm -hmm. you tested positive for marijuana or something. You know? You're not looking at marijuana as the problem. You're looking at the job as the problem. You're looking at the government as a problem. You're looking at everything else. You're not even contemplating the fact that you smoked in a job that you knew you would get fired for as the problem. <laughs> uh, my boss is in the bathroom with me doing it, so I <laughs> thought it was okay. There you go. <clears throat> I handed out brownies, and now HR is calling me. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> but no, addiction is a real thing. I I never understood addiction till till I dated. You know, my mother had talked about her father had been an alcoholic, mm -hmm. and I never understood it because I. I never had a problem with addiction. I, I took a personality test like when I was really young and they said I didn't have an addiction personality, but 
I remember I, I dated someone who had a, an addiction problem with alcohol, and it was a really weird addiction too. Where her father had, her father was a working banker, and so Monday through Friday he would go do banking. He was like a vice president. He was like up there in the old world banking days, and so he would do his work Monday through Friday as a functioning alcoholic. And then as soon as he got home on Friday, he would disappear into his tiki bar in the basement. Yeah. And from Friday night, Sunday night, he would be soused to the to the point of no return, I guess. Yeah. And his, he would disappear from his family, basically. I mean, I suppose you could go down there and hang out with him. I don't know if he was a mean drunk, but she was a mean drunk. But it was weird because she would only drink on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And then she kept it very hidden. The wild turkey was underneath the yeah. sink in the yep. in the things. Mm -hmm. And so for a long time, I couldn't figure out what was going on and why we were breaking up every weekend. Mm -hmm. But then the rest of the time, everything was fine. And then I really started to understand addiction. I went to a couple of AA meetings with her and and really started to see, you know, what the difference was between that and maybe abuse of alcohol, which I've done. Sure. Uh, you know, where you drink it too much and you're... You you drink too often, but you're not addicted where you don't get the shakes or the things. And then the other thing was, is her physiology would change. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Sure. So she wasn't a fun drunk either, mm -hmm. which imagine, I don't know, are most people that are addicted like that? Or is it just some people that have that opposite effect of whatever? Drink yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned about four things that I could hover over and highlight a few misconceptions. Mm -hmm of addiction is that it matters how much you use. Mm. It ha does not matter at all how much you use. It ha it's what happens to you when you do. Uh -huh. And it's, do you do things that you didn't intend on doing? Mm. Okay. Was that part of the plan that night? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's not how much it's more about why and what happens. Is it okay if you don't remember, then that's yeah. fine. What no, no, because somebody remembers usually. Yeah, that's yeah. Like the text message yeah. That calls you. Yeah. And then one of the other misconceptions is that it's, you know, just about, you know, chemicals, because oftentimes when people don't have a problem, like generationally speaking, so mm -hmm. you might have a mom and dad who have no contact with chemicals, alcohol, or drugs because their parents were addicts. But mm. then the children, they usually will. You know, it manifests mm. through behaviors, not always the use of chemicals. Oh. And so you'll see things like rageaholics, right? So the rage comes out, but nobody's medicating it with alcohol or drugs. Wow. So that's, you know, one of the things that I noticed too. And then also the difference between use, abuse, or misuse, right? Mm -hmm. um, and addiction and dependency. So the misconception is that if you're having withdrawals, that's addiction. No, that's dependence. And you can only oh. become physically dependent on certain chemicals like opioids and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So like sniff a bunch of Coke, you're not going to have physical withdrawals. You'll feel like crap, mm -hmm. but it's not the same. And there is a difference between addiction and dependency. That explains it more because I've always mm -hmm. wondered about that. You know, I had friends that would smoke, smoke pot, they'd smoke cigarettes, you know, alcohol issues. Man, if they didn't get their hit, they'd start jonesing. That's right. And I abused alcohol through about 20 years of my life mm -hmm. where I drank pretty heavy. I'm, I'm kind of a, <clears throat> I don't know if I, I, I was, I'm trying to deny it, aren't I? I've always been a big guy and I have a high tolerance for everything like drugs. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even really get into it. It kind of helped me not get into drugs because I have high tolerance for it. I have to have a lot of something to enjoy it. Even like aspirin, yeah. it takes several, it takes a lot more aspirin than normal to, to affect me. And, and so it was good for me, but you know, I have to drink a lot of alcohol. Plus I'm a kind of a big guy. So it takes a lot to get to, to where you need to be. Yeah. Um, and that makes it more dangerous when you have a higher tolerance, doesn't it? I imagine it does. Yeah. yeah that would make sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I never had the jonesing thing. Like my friends mm -hmm. would be like, "You're addicted too," and I'm like, "No, I don't get the shakes, dude." Like if I, if I run in a vodka bottle and I, you know, I'm like, "Hey, let's tie one on for the night mm -hmm. or whatever," and I'm like, oh, "Shit, the vodka bottle's empty or half empty or whatever," I'm just like, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna go sleep and I'll go buy right. a bottle tomorrow. I don't care." But uh, yeah, I've watched my friends go through that. So what's the, the so the difference between that that is dependence? Yeah, the, the alcohol dependence is when you see what happens when they're withdrawing from the alcohol. Uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then you're in Vegas. You've seen Leaving Las Vegas. Is that oh, yeah. what it's called? That's yeah. Movie. That's that's dependency. Yeah. The mm-hmm. but still, if I was abusing it, then that's still addiction because I was still going after it all the time. It could be abuse. It could be misuse. The addiction part comes in when you continue to do it despite consequences. Ah. Mm-hmm. Ah. Well, I mean, good or bad consequences. <laughs> <laughs> most of my they're con- usually bad or negative most my, i mean most of my consequences were just good you feel good yeah. you're happy you go you know tie one on for the night you go to you go to bed it's not good for your sleep i used to be that's true i think it was good for my sleep but oh. i've learned better i in 2020 i just finally quit it and mm-hmm. my body part of it was because i was in my 50s and my body's we're not doing this with you anymore yeah mm-hmm. and then i also kind of tuned into my body i got really healthy lost a lot of weight started eating really healthy mm-hmm. and then i started noticing that you know a few hours of tying one on on friday night translated to three days of bloating and dehydration and amen just Preach. feeling just feeling ground down mm-hmm. i just i was just finally i was just like doing the math i'm like mm-hmm. a couple hours of fun on friday night is not worth yeah. the three days of just i would just drag for two or three days i could mm-hmm. feel my body yeah and so i just tuned into it and i just kind of i just it just kind of disappeared one day i just said i'm not doing it anymore and i think now i mean i'm definitely noticing and i'm one of them People really are paying more attention to their bodies and their hormonal shifts and changes later in life. And they're like, I can't do this alcohol thing anymore. Yeah. And so they just stop. They they stop drinking. They get sober yeah. curious. They disconnect sober. for a while and they and they don't go back. I mean, that's what I was. I was like, I'm just not going to drink for 30 days. And then four years later, I haven't you know, I don't drink sober, sober yeah. curious. I like that. <laughs> I've been sober curious. The uh, but yeah, I just I just you know the bloating you get from the water retention, your body overcompensates, mm-hmm. and so I just be like, there it is. But I imagine you know self being self aware and being self accountable really makes a difference. Maybe I went through some of that. Yeah, yeah, it makes all the difference, and just being willing, at least with yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay to take an honest look at what's going on and and what will it actually take for change to occur. Mm -hmm. And this journal is an opportunity for people to look at certain behaviors and see what else needs to change for that to change. It's usually not as simple as, you know, I'm going to, you know, just look at this behavior every day and it's going to change. You know, it's it's not enough to just track it. So this isn't just a bullet journal that tracks it helps you evaluate. It helps you to go deeper. It helps you to look at the areas of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Chris, I heard you on another one of your episodes and you mentioned that you're ADHD. Yeah. I am. I am too. And people who are dopamine deficient, which is ADHD people, executive functioning is a real challenge. And so I think this is why this journal worked so well for me is because it really helped me with my executive functioning, the things that I just, I would get overwhelmed and I couldn't really, you know, stay consistent. Yeah. I had my ADHD really beat. And then I I, I had my testosterone tested about Mm -hmm. seven, eight months ago. And found that my testosterone was a little bit low. It wasn't too low, but it was low. And so then I got on testosterone. And it's been largely beneficial. But the one Mm -hmm. thing it's brought back is the ADHD. I mean, it's very connected to our hormones and Um, what we're producing and not producing. And so it makes a lot of sense. I did love the way that you talked about it, though, as a superpower because I am such a believer that my ADHD is why I am as good at the things that I am good at. <laughs> yeah. Squirrel. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's good. I've had more trouble managing it and I, I, I need to focus on it. My mom said to me the other day, she goes, your ADHD is really bad. And I was like, squirrel. And yeah. So, I love that. I'm going to focus on my ADHD. <laughs> yeah. Squirrel. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, I'm going to focus on my ADHD. Wait, there's something else. What? The but yeah it's it's always been a challenge but it is the CEO's disease mm-hmm. they they call it that as you probably know because yeah most CEOs have it and it's the mad and man. entrepreneurs and in entrepreneurs. in general yeah, yeah. in general mm-hmm. but it's the madman that helps us create and the the oh, yeah. biggest thing is struggling to harness it when I was young as a teenager you know I would check the door like twenty times 
mm. at night to make sure it was locked. And I think my brother would wash his hands till they bleed. He did that part of the ADHD. I did don't you do that anymore. did you know that there is an OCD type of ADHD? Oh, really? Yeah. So I have that, which oh. is an OCD type of ADHD, and it contributes to things like repetitive body movements and checking. But yeah. when you have the combination of the two, it actually helps quite a bit to manage your symptoms because you do have more of that hyper awareness and focus on certain things. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. 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 The hyper, maybe I have OCD too. I'm not sure. Maybe. I don't know. Every time I go to check, I go find something else to do. But... <laughs> But you know, I know I know the great thing about your book and the journal thing is a lot of my friends who have addiction, it's a daily fight for them. And Absolutely. they've been in recovery for years or 10 years even 20 or 30. It's still a daily battle for them. And so they have to make sure that they're on point every day that they you know, every day they greet the day going it's another day. It's another one day, day at a time. <laughs> one day at a time. And I know, and I, I feel that with my friends when I talk to them about what they go through with it. And, and you just go, wow, that's, I mean, good for you and fight the good fight and, and, and I'll, I'll pour one for you. No, I'm just mm -hmm. kidding. <clears throat> but uh, yeah. It, it is. And that's another thing that I really like about coming back to yourself, coming back mm -hmm. to your journal, coming back to the rooms. <laughs> so that you can stay focused on you know the disease so the disease doesn't creep creep up and get you again because <laughs> it's always like they say in the parking lot doing push-ups just waiting <laughs> in the parking lot doing push-ups <laughs> jesus mm -hmm. um you know i i my girlfriend who had the alcohol issues it eventually killed her so if you're out there mm -hmm. listening please get help the she died of potassium deficiency she'd fallen yeah. and hit her head in the into the bathtub and so she, she was stuck in the bathtub and couldn't get out and her potassium deficiency from loss of potassium from alcohol consumption i didn't even know that was a thing but i had gone to one i think i went to two a meetings with her and i was trying to encourage her to go by being supportive and going her mother pretty much lived at al-anon uh, mm -hmm. and cause you know, she had the father, then she had the daughter mm -hmm. and then, but I, I remember sitting in there and hearing the stories and there was one guy who, who he told the story about how he, you know, he, he was drinking, found himself in the Vidoc under the Vidoc and living on the streets and then got his shit together, got out of addiction, got his family, got a kid, got a wife, got a job. Everything was going good. One day he walks into a bar. Next thing you know, he's under a Vidoc and he's lost everything. Yeah. And I just hear the stories and, you know, one of my friends, one of my friends, one of the, the my girlfriends had a fr girlfriend in the AA that was also an addict. Mm -hmm. And one day I sat down with her husband and I, I said, I don't know how you do it. And he goes, you need to be prepared. This is, this is, she's going to fall off the wagon all her life and everything else. And I'd done his mortgage because <clears throat> his wife had gotten drunk one day, beat him and the kids and went off to Wendover, Utah, or Wendover, Nevada, and wrote an $80,000 check against, against, you know, the house and everything. And, and of course, consequently blew it. So I had to do a mortgage on him to bail him out so that he could pay the casino. But yeah, he told, he started telling me stories of the life and I'm like, I can't, wow. do this. this isn't me. This is, this is the rest of my life. I love her, but mm -hmm. I'm not going down that road. You know, when you look at the disease mm -hmm. process, when you look at how progressive and pervasive it is, it's very clear to me that it doesn't just want one person, but it wants everyone who cares about them. Wow. And it impacts everyone around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, if someone's out there in the audience that's thinking about changing their bad habits, whether they just be like, I want to stop eating cheese because it's bad for me or something or fatty, or, you know, it's someone with addiction. What, what's some advice you would give to people on taking those first steps? Yeah. Gosh, there's a few things that I really, I look at, like as far as key ingredients you know, like what are the key ingredients for success and accountability is one of them. Mm -hmm. And so that can look like 
your journal. <laughs> that can look like therapy. That can look like your meetings. That can look like your sponsor. That can look like the 12 steps. Mm -hmm. But accountability and community, which can also look like those things. So community and connection. It really allows you to get into the third ingredient, which is humility. Mm -hmm. And humility is what it's all about at the end of the day. If I could put humility in a syringe mm -hmm. and bend people over and inject it in them, <laughs> I swear I would have people lined up around the block. Yeah. Because and they would be recovered immediately. Can you set up shop outside the Congress? <laughs> the Congress? Uh, uh, hey, shoot everybody. That would be great yeah. because humility is that healer. Humility yeah. is what we all need to be open, honest, vulnerable, transparent, intimate. All of those things that we're missing. So yeah, and I think. You know, sadly, with addicts, the humility comes when they hit rock bottom, when no one will talk mm -hmm. to them anymore. That's and right. Destroyed all their relationships. And, uh, you know, there's a joke from Dennis Miller that the only time people, no one finds Christ on prom night in the back of a seat, the back of the car, they only find it after they, you know, they're sent to prison and no one will talk to them anymore. And so then you take up conversation with God. Sadly, I think a lot of addicts, addicts end up in that sort of situation where, yeah. you know, it's, you know, that, those were the stories I heard in AA. You know, people had to bottom out before they finally got it. Yeah. But the humility of going, I need help. It's time to ask for help. You know, it's the first step. Yeah. It's powerlessness and unmanageability, yeah. you know, came to believe, right? Yeah. It, it's what it's about is accepting that you can't do this on your own. You can do a ton of things on your own and you can do those well, mm -hmm. but this is one of those things that you will not do in a vacuum. It requires community. It requires mm -hmm. connection. It requires help. And being humble enough to ask for it. I mean, a lot of the people that I know are, who are in early recovery or even long-term recovery, they have a hard time accepting still that they have needs. Mm. And they have an even harder of a time accepting or believing that other people can meet those for them. Mm. Yeah, I think humility. <laughs> what are your thoughts? I mean, I don't want to... I don't want to crap on AA, but I know one of AA's big things is accepting that you don't have full control and yeah. put your hands in God. Yeah. And I'm an atheist. I mm -hmm. and, and you know, hey, if, you, if if that's what you need to to find your way out of the mm -hmm. darkness of addiction, yeah, God bless you. Even though I'm yeah. an atheist, but I the one concern I have about it is. You know, I, I grew up in a cult of religion and believing that there was somebody up in the sky mucking with me mm -hmm. as an evil shithead sometimes, or you mm -hmm. can perceive it as such, really wasn't very empowering to me. And to be, for for me, self-reliance and self-accountability self means that I'm the I'm the last and final boss. Uh, mm. I'm the guy. Everything stops with me. If I was to believe me for me personally that there was still some guy in the sky who I guess on shitty days decides to be shitty to me, that really takes away my ability to be self accountable. I don't know. Am I wrong yeah. there? I think that you share you and millions, maybe billions, share that same sentiment. Mm. Uh this is what I have to say to that is that Yes, recovery requires what we would call a spiritual awakening, mm -hmm. because you can't have recovery without some form of spiritual awakening. But when I look at God in the big book, or I look at God in a 12-step program, I say capital G-O-D stands for good orderly direction. Oh. What is giving you good and orderly direction that is not leading you back to you know your addiction? Mm -hmm. And so for some people that is their meeting for some reason, for some people, it's their, you know, church, for some people, it's their therapist for some, I mean, it, good orderly direction can come from all sorts of things. It can come from inside. Mm. I just, I do think that is a required ingredient on the search for authenticity and humility, mm. a spiritual awakening is part of it. There you go. And I guess, you know, basically God and religion is, is a patriarchy and people like the idea that someone's looking over and has their best interests at heart. So I guess, I guess some people can, 
can can like that. It's just I see a lot of people who who I don't know if they're addicts or not, but they they seem to use God in a very bad format as a as a catcher of all the things they do bad. You know, God made me do it. Well, so. and they and it's like <laughs> fundamentalist. <laughs> I I don't think that religion should be utilized as a weapon. I do think it can be spiritual abuse happens all of the time. Oh, wow. I see it every single day and it really is a barrier to healing oh yeah so must that explains my childhood in the cult i mean <laughs> you're not alone i promise <laughs> <laughs> there you go i think i'm still being abused because i still have family in the cult so i have to deal with it still so, uh, mm -hmm. i should probably think help so what's the best way for someone to reach out if they're hearing in the audience that maybe I need to get some help? But what's the best first step you would advise people to do? Yeah, I, I really recommend that people go to a platform called Psychology Today mm -hmm. and really look at people's areas of specialty. Make mm -hmm. sure they are licensed in the state in which you are seeking services <laughs> and and make sure that they're specialized in the areas where you feel like you're really struggling mm -hmm. uh, and then interview them. Make sure they provide a free consultation where you go in free of charge and sit with them and see if they are a good fit for you because you want to interview them first. Right. To make sure that that's who you want to partner with for your care. I see way too many people not fire their therapist early enough. Mm. And so please shop around like you would for anything. I mean, my gosh, you're going to get three bids on having your toilet replaced. Go and <laughs> make sure that you know, the person that you're going to for, you know, your mental health is the right fit. That's, that makes sense. That makes sense because you're trying to replace the toilet in your brain, you know. Thank you. <laughs> Get three bids, damn it. Make sure that contractor is licensed, as always. Thank you. And don't buy crystals, people. Stop it. In astrology, knock it off, both of you. Final thoughts to people to pitch out to pick up your book uh, as we go out. Yeah, I would just say it's time <laughs> now. Healing and everything you need in you is in you, and it's ready now. <laughs> so go ahead and... Why don't you hop on lightninginabottle.biz or go to Amazon. You can type in Andrea Epting or you can type in the Plan to Recover mini journal. I'd love for you to engage with it and see what happens and how it changes your life. Change your mind. <laughs> there you go. Every day, stay on point. That's the biggest problem we have. You know, we don't. We don't stay on point every day and you, you know, you start sloughing one day and they slough off the next and then you wake up and years have passed and you're like, yeah, I should probably have done that. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming on the show. We really appreciate it, Andrea. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. Order of the book wherever fine books are sold. Plan to recover your mini journal for recovery and self-discovery. And please, like Andrea said, if you feel like you need help, reach out do it don't wait until you hit rock bottom or you hit that point where you're forced to be humble you just don't want to be there man just skip to the skip to the easy part or the good part but please get help seriously especially if you know you have trauma or damage or any of those sort of things from childhood thanks so much for tuning in go to goodreads.com for chess chris foss linkedin.com for chess chris foss chris foss one of the tiktokity and all those crazy places to find on the internet thanks for tuning in be good to each other stay safe we'll see you next time